Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi everybody, I'm Ron Brewington and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Brought to you by Photography as an Art, Harvey Brandman, Master Photographer, located at 1307 North San Fernando Boulevard, Burbank, California. Attorney Ron Irwin's book, Haiku, Style, Passion, Heart. Author Larry Buford's book to the future, Time Travel, Message in a Capsule, State Farm Agent Carla Green, and veteran Rob Brownstein's Actor Training School and Actor Space. Roll it. Can we come in? <sighs> Mad child as she is. My dear. Now, do you think you could finish telling me about your mother? Well, um, mostly she likes to rub my neck. Like this? She's a stone fox. Watch your ass. What's what, Digger? You are really one ugly child. I mean, it's really too bad. Because, uh, if you wasn't, we could, uh, spend the time, you know, uh, doing the thing. I'll put a sack over my head. All right. Oh, I just wanted to see if it was gonna fit. Fuck off. <laughs> Please. Well, it's almost lunchtime. Would you like a um, sandwich or something? No, I'm not hungry. You go ahead, though. Well, I left the kids at Joy, so I guess I better go pick them up. Will you be all right? Yeah. You sure? Yes. First guest today is a marvelous lady from a humble upbringing. She was born right here in Los Angeles, California. After graduating from high school, she attended LA City College. Always striking, let me emphasize that, always striking. She was taught modeling by her sister and got to audition for the prestigious Ebony Fashion Fair. She became the youngest model for the show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a longtime friend, veteran actress, Judy Pace. Judy, thank you so, Ooh. so, so much How for coming here. Doing, I am great, Lila. Good to see How you. How you doing? So good to Ugh. see you. Oh, you lady. always full of energy. When I'm and around you, you, can't help it. myself. Catch can't it. help myself. <laughs> Again, welcome to the Actors' Thank Choice. You. you started as a model. Tell us how you got into acting. That's the way, where the money's at. Oh, well, I got into acting because that's what I always had wanted to do. Yes, ma'am. But there was nowhere for me to do it. Why? I couldn't even get into the high school drama class uh. <laughs> because the teacher was a very lovely teacher, but he would say, if I don't think you're going to be able to work, there's really no reason for you to do this. So we're talking 50s, and there really was no work for dark brown chocolate ladies who did not want to play maids. <laughs> okay. So I always wanted to go back and say, see, I told you so. <laughs> but I never had the opportunity. Got you. Never, ever, ever. And I got into modeling because of... Um, Always wanted to do that, but dear, dear, dear friend of mine, we were high school buddies. Yes. A Marilyn McCoo of the Fifth Dimension. Mm -hmm. She called me one day and said, they're going to be auditioning for the Ebony Fashion Fair. You got to go, you got to go. I said, are you going? She says, no, Mommy said I have to finish college. <laughs> and she did. And, and they went on to be a fabulous group, the Fifth Dimension. So she's the reason why I got my first job. <laughs> the job was 13 Frightened Girls. Oh, yes. Oh, gosh. Director William Castle opened that door for you. Yes, he did. William Castle saw me on the cover of, I'm sorry, saw me in print for Pepsi. I was the international face for Pepsi as a mm -hmm. model. And he saw me and uh, called Mr. Johnson or called John Ebony Passion Fair and, and Mrs. Johnson and found out who I was and had me come into, uh, into uh, for an audition at Columbia Studios. And I did, and I got the gig, and I was the first black <laughs> under contract to Columbia Studios. All right. History. History. <laughs> yeah, we're talking way back in the day. 
But then you became a regular. Batman, 1966. You did The Flying Nun, Mod Squad, and many, many others. Like you say, it was a different time back there, especially oh, yeah. for blacks. I oh, hope yeah. that our young blacks will understand this is what people like yourself went through to oh, open that door for them. Oh, absolutely. It was like you were, co you were constantly in battle. Mm -hmm. You were constantly in battle. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. um, it was just so few out there working. Yes. And um, you just had to keep that positive thought going. I'm going to be in this business. <laughs> I'm going to be in it. 1969, you found TV success in the nighttime soap opera called Peyton Place. Oh, yes. Who was I... that, Vicki Fletcher? Oh, my God. That was just like the dream come true. And I'm working with persons that I have admired. I'm working with Ruby Dees, playing my mother-in-law-to-be. I'm with Glenn Turman, and we are the first black family of drama on television. And I became the first black villainess on television. I was real mean and real nasty and had hitchhiked all the way from Harlem to accuse the doctor's son of being the father of my to-be child. Oh, and I was also the first black woman on television to be pregnant. Whew, go ahead, girl. Go ahead <laughs> with your bad self. Go ahead. It was a lovely, yes, lovely role. Yes, I'd have women on the street mad at me because mm. <laughs> I was so evil. And then there came a term coined by a fellow named Julius Griffin. He was the head of the L.A. NAACP mm -hmm. called Black Exploitation Films. I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, the definition is it's a, a term coined in the early 70s to I, refer to black action films who were aimed at black audiences. And a very negative one, too. Absolutely yes, negative. Yes, it was. So but I better always, than nothing. No, I think there were other positive terms we could have used yes. to, to, to celebrate the work and the, and the new kinds of careers that were available behind the camera, in front of the camera, mm -hmm. except for ex black exploitation films. I always refer to that area and that group and that time as the black film renaissance. Much Big. better name. Much better name, yes. I think that's a much better name because we had made films in the past, yes. but not at the level that it, it started to go. So I refer to that era as the black film renaissance. Hmm. Uh, you were referred to as another thing, too, the but, new black woman. You were confident, strong, sweet, <laughs> sexy, vivacious, and of course, beautiful. You can keep going. <laughs> Look, you know, if I was 20, I'd tell you to stop, but I'm not 20 anymore, honey. You can just keep that coming up. Come on, come on. You know? <laughs> I heard they had a doll even named after you. Oh, my goodness. They used to call me Black Barbie. Go ahead. I didn't mind. Yes. Take me to the show. I did not mind at all. Really but you cool. also conquered the stage, too, Judy, didn't you? I had the most delicious role and a stage production mm -hmm. done just exactly like the Broadway play, and that was called Guys and Dolls. Wow. And I got to play my dream role. I played Adelaide, who was the, the, the showgirl and as dumb as could be. So it was a fun comedy piece. I love comedy more than anything. Gary Marshall was my first manager. The situation comedy icon mm -hmm. that he saw me in, in class with his sister. And he was going to get me a TV series and everything. But at that time, there weren't any comedy, situation comedy shows on the air. And when he finally did get me one, I was already in a series playing a young lawyer, kind of the opposite of comedy. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, was, he was good to me. He taught me a lot. He really, really was. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In your personal life, you were married to actor Don Mitchell, you had yes. two children from that marriage, mm -hmm. and then later you married baseball legend Kurt Flood. Yes, I did. And the funny thing about it is that... That handsome young man right there. Oh, oh. oh that's great. Oh, 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 yeah, handsome. He's so handsome. <laughs> Absolutely. And my, my, the father of my children, Don yeah. Mitchell, he was, he was very handsome, yes. too, and, very, and a wonderful actor. Yes. He was on Ironside for... Yes. Oh, God, almost a decade mm -hmm. he was there. Mm -hmm. And um, Kurt Flood yes. became my second husband. But the funny thing about it is Don Mitchell was my first boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And we kind of broke up because he was busy and I was busy. And then <laughs> Kurt Flood became my second boyfriend. Yes. And um, we broke up. Okay. <laughs> Be, uh, but that's a whole other kind of story. I understand. Because, because we were going to talk about that later. Yes. And then we got married. So. Got you. Yeah. So I had known them forever, both of them. Got you. Got you. <laughs> now, he was, now, Kurt was a top hitter. 
Uh, he, but tell us about what was happening to him as a baseball well, player. Well, as a baseball player, Kurt was a was Kurt Flood, center fielder, mm -hmm. all star. Mm -hmm. He won seven consecutive Gold Gloves. That means you're the best center fielder with all of the between all of the teams. Seven consecutive Gold Gloves. He also had two World Series rings. He also had the record for errorless consecutive games, over 200 and something games. He was in, and he was captain of the team, co-captain, first black to be co-captain of a baseball team. He was magnificent, and he was an artist, and he was so handsome, and <laughs> just the best personality you ever wanted to see. Am I talking too much about my Oh, no, 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 keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> But he was just magnificent, and mm -hmm. he was in Major League Baseball for over 16 years. Wow. 16 years. And he was a part of that first generation of um, black ball players signed right after Jackie Robinson within that era. Mm -hmm. So they were still going through the racial situations, uh, uh, I mean, to the extreme, to the extreme. Um, one team, how can I say this, in the minor league, all the black guys had to live together. What? This was in the South. We, we all think we know the story, no. but Jackie, with his magnificent, mm, talented self, Jackie Robinson, they would not send him to the South. He went to Canada to the minor league. After he made it through, they said, okay, let's put the other guys are going to go through the South. Right. So you can imagine what that might have been like in the 50s, in the South, in the early 60s, in the South for these guys. That's why they couldn't live at the hotel. They could not dress in the dressing room. <laughs> it, right. was, it was a lot. It was a lot. Right. It really was. Tony, can you show that next picture that we have up there? For, up to, up, there you go. Can you read that, what it says, my dear, about uh, Kurt Flood? Darling... Yes. Like I said, I'm not 20 anymore. <laughs> you well, can basically, read what it. he's saying was the difficulty that he went through during that time, uh, which you just tell us about. Oh, and, and yes. He said he was a man who was independent. He didn't have to put up with it, that kind of stuff. No, no, no. he was not. He right. was not. Absolutely mm. not. In fact, he was on the cover of uh, Sports Illustrated, was he not? Yes, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated mm -hmm. as the best center fielder in the in, in Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, he mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. He was just fantastic. Indeed. Uh, that's him. Yes. Catching and, and if you look closely, you'll see he has the ball in his hand. Yes, he does. In his glove. In his glove, yes. It's a good 400, 400, and I think it's 400 feet. Now, you guys were both stars. Here he is a baseball star, and here you are a movie star, and you got a chance to meet a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. This next one is a very interesting picture. Oh, yes. Oh, William yes. Clinton and Mrs. Clinton. <laughs> you? Oh, yeah. This was for the premiere uh -huh. of the Ken Burns epic, nine innings in baseball, and, the, and it was nine hours long, and they premiered it at the, um, at the White House. Wow. And Kurt and one other gentleman are the only ones who's, who are in every episode. He's in all nine episodes. He came to wow. the house and videotaped me for days. Your daughter was, <laughs> which daughter was this? That was That's you? my daughter. That was my, that's my daughter, Sean, my Sean. attorney, mm -hmm. Howard graduate. I'm mm -hmm. very proud of my daughter. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, Okay. Yes. She, the next picture, sir. Oh. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That was such oh, a special, special yes. time because they refer to Kurt as the... Miss Rosa Parks. I, I get so... Um, I know. I, I, lo I love that photo. Yes. They refer to him as the Rosa Parks of sports. Oh, he yeah. freed everybody. <laughs> he mm. really did. Wow. And that was at a gathering that Kwanzaa Foundation gave. It was an organization of women in the entertainment industry, right. and I'm the founder. Right. You, uh, who <laughs> else was in the founding organization? Oh, again? there were the Academy Award nominees. There were, um, let's see, um, the Nichelle Nichols, mm -hmm. um, uh, Pam Greer, mm -hmm. uh, Beverly Todd. Um, uh, uh, Mary Wilson, Hattie Winston, wow. I just, it was just Marla Gibbs, wow. Esther Rose, <laughs> Quite a few Isabel Sanford. We Heard all that members. name before. Yes, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, can you hold that for just one second, sir? Uh, in 1997, unfortunately, he died. Yes, he did. He passed away in yeah. 1997. Um, uh, Curtis referred to as Rosa Parks because he is the man who's responsible for free agency as it is today yes. within the world of sports. He changed the way they do business in all disciplines of sports. Kurt did. He took a case. First, free agency. There was a clause in every ball player's contract that when you signed with the team, 
you basically were then owned by that team. You, they had to tell you where you could go. They had to tell you when you had to go. They had to tell you what team we might send you to. Um, they owned you. And it was called the Reserve Clause. And they did not have to, to um, participate in all of the regular business rules that, that the government had put out there. They had a special situation for mm -hmm. Major League Baseball. Uh, Congress had given them. I, I always refer to it as 100 years ago. They had had this system. Right. And for um, African American to be thought of as a piece of property, as, uh, as currency, I can sell you to the team over there, yes. or I'm tired of you now and I'm going to send you to a team over here. You were wow. never allowed to go out and try to determine or let persons know or other teams know that I'd like to leave you, I want to go and play ball over here. You couldn't do that. You were actually owned. And if you didn't go where they were going to send you, then you, weren't not, you were not going to be playing, um, playing the sport. That was the end of it. So Kurt thought that was a bit out of line, mm -hmm. being a black person whose ancestors who had been bought and sell, we might not want to do this. So he wrote a letter. They just celebrated this letter um, <laughs> to Bowie Kuhn, who was the, uh, commissioner. the commissioner, mm -hmm. commissioner. And the main line in the letter was, I am not a piece of property Come on. to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes. And then it goes on to tell all the re legal reasons why, but that was the gist of it. Kind of shook up, they call it the bullet letter. <laughs> mm. it's, but, and he took a case all the way to, to the Supreme Court, um, and people say that he lost the case, mm -hmm. but he really didn't lose the case because the Supreme Court could not give him an answer. They said, you have to go to Congress to get the answer because Congress gave Major League Baseball this very privileged situation. Right. So um, after Kurt passed away, a year later, Congress gave him his answer with the Kurt Flood Act, Bill Number 21, that then Correct. removed the, the, the privilege that Congress, had, that Congress had given Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. Although... Free, free agency had been in practice for quite a while, mm -hmm. but they formally did uh, give that to Kurt, which I wow. thought was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> now that next picture, would you go to that next one for us? Ah, there we go. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. That's, I'm now with Major League Baseball Players Association. Yes. I'm their ambassador, ambassador for their charitable trust and also other situations. So this was the 50th anniversary of the union. Okay. Major League Baseball Players Association is the players' union. And they celebrated by having this postal stamp of okay. Kurt. And I, 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 Kurt would have just loved that. They just adore Kurt. When you walk into the building, to their building, there is this archway. And over the archway, it's, this, it, it's written, all ball players should to should give special thanks. Right, because y'all making all the big money. <laughs> give special thanks right. to Kurt Flood. It goes on with other wording, but that's the mm -hmm. gist of it. Right. So um, that case went all the way to the Supreme Court, changed the way they do business, right. and um, that's what's happening. How about the Hall of Fame? Did he ever get into that? He is not in the Hall of Fame. I do mm. not understand why this incredible ball player named Kurt Flood, my husband, mm. is not in the uh, Hall of Fame because there are people sitting in the Hall of Fame or being honored in the Hall of Fame who have lower stats than he does. Oh, yeah. So we've been working on that for quite a while. The <sighs> union has, and I have, so it's is going it a to happen. <gasps> Got you. Is it a 10-year... Is it a ten-year um, limit? But then they can go into what they call. Um, uh, it, there's a word for the guys who played like in the '40s and the right. '30s. They still can be voted in once they reach that okay. threshold. Okay. Yeah. Next picture, please, if you would. Okay. Who? No, next one, not that one. Okay. Uh, okay, that's a good one. Right, oh, right there. Yes. there she is. There no, no. she is. There, there she, she is. is. There is the one we're looking for. Oh, that's my daughter. That's my. Youngest daughter. Your daughter? My daughter. Is today her birthday? Yes, today is her birthday. When you, when you see her, please give yes, that to I her for will. me, please. I most certainly will. Please, love wish her happy birthday. She's an actress, actress. and also a Howard graduate. And Woo! she also has a master's degree in mm. performing arts. Mm. Mm. I always I brainwash my daughters. Education, mm. education, and some more education. Ed education. And some yeah. more education. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, here's a shot of you. Uh, oh, with, oh. Look at this. That's was taken the opening night for Don Welch 
uh, the divorce. Yes. Because I, I was in that right. show. I was in the show, yes. and they came out to see me. Aren't they cute? Now, who, please point out oh, who's on the left. <laughs> that is on, on your left? My, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, that picture. is my daughter, Julia, who's Julia. the actress. Actress. She, you would have seen her on The Young and the Restless. Yes. She received um, three consecutive nominations for NAACP Image Awards right. for Best Actress. And then that's me in the middle with one grin and real heart. Yes. <laughs> See? <laughs> and then my attorney and my daughter yes. with her brilliant self. Yes. And she's gorgeous. Yes. So that's my crew right there. <laughs> Can you give us that next picture? Because we're running out of time, but we oh, need that next, next picture. Oh, who is oh, this oh, young oh, man? Oh, that's the one who has my heart now. <laughs> I mean, along with my daughters, but he's just got it. That's my grandson. That's my grandson. And his name is? Stephen Hightower III. The third. Wow. The third. How old is he now? He is six years old. Wow. And this is my daughter, Julius, my daughter who's the actress. Yes. That's her son. Um, and he's just a delight. And just the happiest child you ever would see. Wow. <laughs> Judy. One thing for sure, and we run out of time right now, but I got to give you something. Okay. You know you've seen these oh, yes. many times, yes. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Yes. I love these. Yes. He hands these out. So if you see him, just tap him on the shoulder. You might get one, okay? <laughs> and of course, for your presence here today, oh, thank you thank so, you. so much. Thank you, thank I wish you. we had more time to go on. Oh, we would have had a good old time. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, we did. I had fun. By. Thank you. Thank you, Stop darling. And we're going to go out the same way we came in. Tony, you ready? Can you roll that video? Thank you so much. Judy Pace, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, oh. Sick and ailing, the old doctor came. Who came when I was sick? Did I sew your dress or was you a sewing mine? Did I draw your bath of water or twas it the other way around? You never complained. You could have left any time you wanted to. Where was I going and with what? Well, he treats me nice enough. He wouldn't dare admit that we're shaking him up. <laughs> Nobody ever invites guests for the July. And I bring you, a girl, <laughs> worse, sexy model. <laughs> and that ain't all either. Man, has he gone and got himself some reputation. I swear. <laughs> what kind of reputation? Well, now, they claim he's the absolute wildest bed mate there is at Willard. My friends are prone to make that claim, yes, sir. I could, yeah. yeah, I bet you could. Mm -hmm. Make you could. feel good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, don't go funning me. Just a couple of days, huh? Okay. You son of a bitch! But I got your blood out oh, now! Cool it. Tell me to cool it! You left me for the cops. Nigga, I ought to kill you! You shut your mouth! I'll get you with that single I swear on my mother's grave I'll get you by that! Look, what I'm trying to tell you is, A, he is not your lawyer. And B, you might not even need a lawyer. I don't have to listen to you. And who's going to tell you like it Come is? On. This is The Actor's Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. The studio of Harry Brandman Photography as an Art is proud to offer you a $100 discount off any photo package valued at $300 or more. Now, Harvey's been in the business for nearly a quarter of a century, and he certainly knows how to take care of his customers. So please give him a call today at 818-954-9294. That's 818-954-9294. You'll be glad you did. And please, by the way, tell Harvey that you heard about his offer right here on The Actor's Choice. Haiku. Style. Passion, heart. It's the latest release from author and attorney Ron Irwin. The book was inspired by the author's first exposure to haiku well over a half century ago. Now, this experience produced within him a deep passion to experience Asia, which he later did as a U.S. Marine. The book is available in paperback at lulu.com. That's lulu.com. And Irwin says he'll give 20% of net book sales split evenly between the veterans of foreign wars and the Vietnam veterans of America. Book to the future. Time travel. Message in a Capsule. It's a new book by author Larry Buford. It's a historical and faith-based account of how what we do and follow today will affect us tomorrow. The author also calls it an adventure for those who want to travel back through time. The book is now available in paperback for only $17.95 from Amazon. So please, get your copy today. And now, a word from State Farm agent Carla Green. Roll it. Let me ask you something. What do you see when you look at your home and your car? Do you see a bundle? A combo deal? 
That's how other insurance companies see them. But a State Farm agent sees so much more. Because the State Farm agent sees your home and your car as more than just four walls and four wheels. They see the things you've worked really hard for. So why not give them the protection they deserve? Let me help you with that. Give me a call. State Farm agent Carla Green, 213-239-9675. I look forward to speaking with you. Thanks, Carla. And like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. For more information, call 213-239-9675. That's 213-239-9675. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a new sponsor, an actor's space with classes and private coaching by veteran actor Rob Brownstein. An actor's space is Thursday night classes for working actors and Tuesday night foundation and technique classes for early career actors. The idea is to build on each actor's strengths and who you are to help refine and reimagine your acting and your career. For more information, contact class at robbbrownstein.com. That's class at robbbrownstein.com. Or call him at 323-646-1268. 323-646-1268. Thank you. The Ebony Repertory Theater, in conjunction with the International City Theater, proudly presents for your enjoyment Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill. The play stars the magnificent sound of singer Carol Foreman as she performs Billie Holiday's music February 6th through March the 1st. Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill is not to be missed. For more information, please call the ERT at 323-964-9766. That's 323-964-9766. Thank you. And finally, if you have a product, a service, or an upcoming event that you'd like to see advertised on this program, please call 323-533-1036. That's 323-533-1036. Our prices are very affordable. Thank you. This is The Actor's Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. Roll it. Joining us now, Mo Kelly. He's the host of The Mo Kelly Show and The Mo Kelly Experience. I'm joined by Mo Kelly, political commentator and talk radio host Mo Kelly. Mo Kelly. Well, politics are like the weather. They change every five, six days. You know, just wait 20 minutes, the weather will change. You saw a much freer President Obama in the sense as far as his blunt terminology, calling Russia a smaller nation, a weaker nation, lacking innovation, not being able to export anything that anybody would want. He was talking directly to Vladimir Putin. And personally, I wish I would have seen more of this type of President Obama in previous years. And as far as whether it's hurting us right now, I I call this pizza and pancakes. You can eat pizza and pancakes for a few years before it shows the effects. Doesn't mean that it's healthy. She was playing to the crowd, and that's the tenor of this campaign. And she has to know what people are looking for, looking for for someone who can defend against Trump, who can meet Mm -hmm. Trump, to your point, beat him with his own tactics. But I don't know long term whether that is the most effective strategy in which to address him. What is the likely end? Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest is a radio and television commentator. He specializes in politics and current affairs. Recently, he's heard weekends as the host of a, let's make that presently, he's heard now on weekends (laughs) as the host of a three-hour award-winning show on the number one news talk station in America. That's KFI AM 940 here in Los Angeles and iHeartRadio. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, he's well-known around the world, Morris W. Kelly, better known as Mo Kelly. Well, you make it sound like I'm actually somebody. <laughs> You're somebody. Yeah, it's a lot of but guys. Thank you for having oh, me, Ron. Man, I appreciate I can, that. When you look at your resume, you go, damn, that's another been around. <laughs> been around. You, Mo, you have been, as I said, quite a resume. Where are you from originally, sir? Born and raised here in Los Angeles. And it's weird because I come from a very small family. Uh-huh. So I'm the only one who was born and raised here in Los Angeles. My mother's from Detroit, my father's from Lynchburg, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And somehow I got born here in in Los Angeles. I have an older sister, she was born in Washington, D.C. But uh, this is and will always be home for me. Excellent, excellent. Now I see you went to Georgetown? Yes, yes, and that's the connection to Washington, D.C. Both my parents and my sister, as a matter of fact, went to Howard University. When I came of age, I said, well, I'm not going to Howard University. I can't keep that string going. (laughs) But I love the city of Washington, D.C. It's it's a magnificent city, even more so now. I visited the campus once, and I said, this is going to be my home. Yes. 
I always tell a lot of you, my friends, students, whatever the case may be, if you never get a chance in life, certain, certain cities in this country you need to see. Mm -hmm. And Washington's D.C., as I yes, call it, is yes, that city. Yes. I mean, they got those crabs up there, some fine people up there, some good schools. You, as you said, your parents went to the Bison's Howard University. That's right. That's right. Oh, good school there. How did you first get into broadcasting, sir? You got, you got a good look. You got the voice. <laughs> well, it, it's funny because it was a circuitous route, and I sort of backed into it. Mentioning my parents, they dabbled in the industry. They were doing some studio sessions for Tina Turner okay. before I was born. And so I was always on the fringe of it and knew something about it. But when I went to college, I had a friend by the name of Chris Williams. You may not know who he is. He's an actor, but he was the is the younger brother of Vanessa Williams, the right. former first Miss Black Miss America. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to the music business. I wanted to really be in the music business. I went to school thinking I was going to be a corporate lawyer, but instead I ended up uh, majoring in marketing, minored in music, and put it together. You got the business of music. So when I came out of school, mm -hmm. I was working at different record companies, worked for Capitol Records, Virgin Records, Interscope, Warner Brothers, and even the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra. That was my foray into entertainment. But broadcasting was an adjunct of that. Working in the music business, you have relationships with people, obviously, in radio. Mm -hmm. And it was because I was actually a listener and, I would say, a contributor to a show called The Jim Rome Show, a uh, sports broadcaster. Okay. And I was sending in, back then, faxes every single day. And Jim really liked my content. To the point where he called me one day and said, Mo do you think that you could actually write for me on a daily basis? And I said, yes. <laughs> and that was my first radio job. This was about maybe 2001 or so. Gotcha. And, and from there, and I left the music business to make the story shorter because there was a consolidation going on. It was the digital music age in which there were fewer record companies, fewer jobs because there weren't people buying albums of eight or nine songs anymore. They were downloading them. They yes. were purchasing them one at a time. And so I made my segue from the music business, record labels, into radio, and I started producing. And that's how I started in terms of broadcasting. Got gotcha. you. Got you. You mentioned Jim Rome. There are other people that you got involved with. Uh, Ryan Seacrest? Yeah, from going from Jim Rome to Ryan Seacrest, they're both under an umbrella called Premier Radio Networks. Got you. And I had a great time. If anything, working for Jim Rome and Ryan Seacrest, both are masters of their respective fields in terms of interviews. Gotcha. Learning how to be a generous listener, learning how to have a conversation with someone but not get in the way of the subject. Got gotcha. you. You also work with a good friend of mine, Tavis Smiley. Tavis Smiley went from Tavis Smiley after Ryan Seacrest, another person masterful with the interview, but specifically in politics and current affairs, also popular culture. But it, it gave me a very firm foundation for ultimately what I wanted to do when I wanted to express myself and further develop my own voice. Gotcha. You've done that so far. I see you've been featuring the L.A. Times, the New York Times. This is your work. Uh, the Huffington Post, CNN. Mm. MSNBC, Good Morning America. I can go on and on and on. It's I'm it's been a process. <laughs> it's been a process, yes. and and I and I say that humbly. I say it if only because mm -hmm. it takes a long time to get to each next step. Yes, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Yes, and what you've told me is just I've had a lot of steps in this journey, and there are more steps to be taken. To be taken. Uh, would you call yourself a news junkie? Oh, absolutely. I love it like people like sports. <laughs> I, I spend, if there's anything that I take pride in, it's, it's my preparation. Gotcha. There's an hour and a half in which I will, when I wake up in the morning, just look at the news to increase my baseline of information. And before I go to bed, mm -hmm. I spend an hour and a half just reviewing as many news sources as possible because in my business, yes. credibility is my currency. Oh, oh no question. And yeah. there's nothing worse than being ill-prepared for any type of conversation or interview. So it's incumbent upon me to make sure that I'm as prepared as possible. I call it the seven Ps. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Well, yeah, we have, we call it the 12 <laughs> Ps when I was pledging to make a sci-fi fraternity. <laughs> piss poor performance. <laughs> <laughs> produces piss poor production. Piss poor production produces pain. You know. Gotcha, gotcha. You said Omaha. I mean, uh, uh, Omega, Omega Sci-Fi. Congratulations. Yeah. Man. Good organization. Yeah. Good. What made you choose 
and with, with that voice, with, with all the stuff, the credentials you had, graduate and everything, what made you choose being a commentator? You could have been a jock. You could have done a lot of things. I think it, 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 it grew as a natural extension. I didn't start off as a commentator. Okay. I, I had to become a student of my craft in the sense of you have to learn how to Take an interview, as in being an interview subject. Yep. Learn how to answer the questions in a digestible, relatable, and a, a consumable way. Yes. And then you have to grow to maybe doing long for conversations. Then you learn how to conduct an interview, being on in your chair. And then you learn how to lead a conversation when there's no one to talk to. Because when you're doing radio, you're in a room all by yourself, right. talking to a wall. <laughs> and you have to somehow be interesting. Right. And there's a process, a growth process in all of that. Mm -hmm. And so it, it wasn't like I said I was going to be a commentator. I just wanted to have a platform and space to be able to share some thoughts that I had gotcha. that I thought might be a benefit to someone else. Gotcha. You know, sometimes I think people forget the meaning of politics. Can you tell us that define politics? What is that? Politics is a sport. Politics is a game. Politics is a way of maneuvering for power on a local, state, and national level. It is about changing the way we live. It's about power over other people. Mm -hmm. Some use it for good. Yes. Some use it for less than good. Yes. But politics is, I would just say, I would throw it in the bowl of that gamesmanship, if you will, to maneuver and manipulate society at large. God, because this week has been one of the worst events coming out of the White House. I mean, Jesus. Well, Christ. wait until next week. It might be different. <laughs> I mean, there's no telling what tomorrow is going to bring. This is true. It's like the weather. If you don't like it, just wait five minutes. Wow. I mean, I saw an article yesterday where the Republicans said, uh, some of the senators over there said that they voted only because they feared the president. And I'm not so sure it's fear of the president is what the president may do as far as primarying mm -hmm. um, certain senators or Congress people. President Trump has a, and this is my word, a mm -hmm. cult-like hold over his base. They do not question him. They believe him implicitly. And it does not matter what he says. They will accept it as truth. He has weaponized information in the way that if he says X about a person, Mm -hmm. His supporters will believe that. Now, how that relates to politics is if he says that this person is the enemy, be it the press, be it the Democrats, mm -hmm. be it a Republican who does not align him or herself with her, mm -hmm. then he will turn his base and weaponize them against him or her, which can e e uh, involve a primary contest or loss of support in a general election for a senator or a congressperson. And if you're in politics, your job is to stay employed, to stay in power, to stay in your position. And if President Trump can effectively remove your support, then you cannot stay in power, going back to that whole idea of politics. Mm -hmm. And so he has a stranglehold of not over, only, only over his base, but people within the Republican caucus and Republican Party. Mm. Wow. Uh, I, I just wanted to detour for, detour for just a second. We'll come back to that because mm -hmm. I'm looking at the time. I just want to get this bit in. Sure. As, we, as I'm going through your bio, I heard a sound bite from you on, on the radio, like you said. And I noticed that we opened the show with your clips of you on television. Let's see him on radio. At the tone, the time will be exactly time for the Mo Kelly Show. Set it off, Mr. Mo Kelly. Mo Kelly Show. Turn it up, baby. Mo Kelly. Here we go again. Mo Kelly. Next on the Mo Kelly Show, Trump impeachment defense counsel team member Alan Dershowitz drops me a line in just minutes. That could be the whole damn show right there. But also New York Times bestselling author Shannon and Dean Hale will tell us about Diana Prince as a child before she became Wonder Woman. Kelly. Mr. Mo Kelly here, KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. When I was a kid growing up listening to people like Ken Minyard, Bob Arthur, Paul Harvey, I thought about how cool it could be to be that voice on the radio, to have something to say about things that were going on in the news around the world. 
And as I got older and had a better understanding of history, there are certain moments, certain people, certain voices that we get to hear time and time again who get to contextualize the moment in which we're in. Wow. Wow. That says a lot. Thank you. Thank you. That says that shows you all the people that who you've admired. Those are the people when we're teaching broadcasters, as, as I do. You try to say these are the people you want to mock, be like them, mm-hmm. learn from them what you can. Look, they laid the foundation. Get out there and be like them. Use them as a model. It's difficult what I do in the sense of when you're doing radio, you have to have. It's like music. It's like a poem. It's like a story. There has to be a beginning, middle, and end. It's not stream of consciousness where you're just talking. Uh, without a specific goal in mind. You have to start at the end. You have to know what you want to say mm-hmm. and then put it in a way which pe- it, people can understand it and then they understand why you're talking about it and then they want to come back for the next segment. Well and, and that's a part of what I do on a daily basis. It's not easy, but it's enjoyable. Well spoken, sir. Well spoken. I read that you do an annual Grammy Spectacular. Can you tell us about that? I used to work for the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, okay. NARIS, the organization responsible for the Grammys. Yes. This was in the mid-90s. And it allowed me to have these experiences, this knowledge, and uh, just an insight that most people would not have because you're n- not working at the Grammys. And, and we did one show on one occasion when we talked about, hey, this is what happens behind the scenes of the Grammys. This is the voting process. These are what the star is actually saying backstage. And it received a tremendous response. So much so, we just decided to do it each and every year. And it allowed people to say what goes on, not necessarily with the Grammys only, but it gives you insight to other award shows in general. And with the latest controversy with the with the Grammys as far as uh, the, the, the firing slash uh, removal of Deborah Duggan, Duggan the, the most recent president, it allowed me to step in and say, hey, let me tell you about the previous president, Neil Portnow, who I worked with and how that might fit into what's going on right now. Yes. And at the end, when we get old and gray, all we have are the stories. That, that's, that's part of what we have. And what I have of value is some stories, and maybe I've walked in some places that other people have not. Mm. Interesting, because the firing of that lady happened the night, one day before the Grammys were supposed to hit the air. Right. And you said to yourself, they can't take that off the air. All the money's been spent, the commercials, the time, the blah, 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 blah. You, what's going to happen? It's going to happen one way or the other. Right, it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, that's all in the back. Yeah. Marvelous, marvelous. What did you think about the Oscars last night? They were the Oscars. In other words, let me put it like this. Each year we talk about hashtag Oscars so white. Mm -hmm. And as an African-American man, I am sensitive to how we are portrayed in in media, Mm -hmm. radio, TV, movies, all of that. But I, I also understand as being a broadcasting professional, I don't get so wrapped up in it that I don't lose sight of the bigger issue. Right. The bigger issue, I think that we as African Americans put too much on affirmation from outside our community. We want the recognition of the Oscars. We want the recognition of the Grammys. And that has its place. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we still get upset when we don't get it. Right. It's not for us. It's mm-hmm. not about us. The Oscars are 90% non-black, so why would they ever feature us. And the times that we are featured is usually a slave movie or something from segregation. Mm -hmm. Voter registration, voter voting. Mm -hmm. People voting. What do you say about that? Because as they say, if we can't get them in court, I'm talking about the president, Mm -hmm. you can get them at the polls. What do you think? Well, yes, we could, but sometimes people don't understand the fullness of voting. For, For example, when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were going up against each other, a common refrain was, well, I don't like either candidate, or they're both equally bad. But they lost sight of the fact that whoever wins the Oval Office gets to pick the Supreme Court justices, gets to choose the federal judges, gets to have a say as far as legislatively where this com- uh, country goes. Mm-hmm. The difference between Republicans and Democrats, in a general sense, mm-hmm. the Democrats want to fall in love with their candidate. Mm-hmm. And they're willing to stay home if they don't love that candidate. The Republicans did not love Donald Trump, but mm-hmm. they fell in line and understood that regardless, he's going to be our guy. He's going to be the guy who gives us those Supreme Court justices, as he did. He's going 
going to give us those federal judges and listening to other people like Mitch McConnell as far as appointments. And he did. He's going to give the tax cut, which their base wanted. And he did. They don't have to like Donald Trump to get what they wanted from the Republican president of the United States. They may have held their nose, but they still voted for him. A lot of people on the Democratic side of the aisle, and I'm a registered independent, to be clear, a lot of people on the Democratic side of the aisle voted for Jill Stein, yes. or they stayed home, or they did a protest vote for Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And then they're, now they're complaining like, well, what's going on with our country? Well, you had a say. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just voting. It's about being intelligent about the fullness of the process and what's at stake. And now people are upset and they wanted to protest in the streets. They wanted to say, I can't stand this guy in the White House. But they had the opportunity in November of 2016 to do the right thing. And it's not my fault that they didn't know what was at stake. Mm. Mercy. We run out of time. Uh, how can people hear you? Where would they have to dial on the radio? When can they hear you? See well, you? they can always find me online. I respond to all email, tweets, Instagram posts, at Mr. Mo Kelly, M-R-M-O-K-E-L-L-Y. Twitter and Instagram. My website is MrMoKelly.com. I'm host of the Mo Kelly Show Saturdays and Sundays from 6 to 8 p.m. on the number one news talk station in America, KFI AM 640 and iHeartRadio. I love what I do because, if anything, I get to both dispel the myths about African-American men. I get to be a, a prime example as opposed to a cautionary tale. Wow. Wow. Mm. Can I have your right hand, please? Uh, this is my trademark. I give people a silver dollar for good luck. Hold on to that for good luck. I, wish I will. Had, I wish we had more time to talk to you. Sir. I appreciate you, oh, and yeah. I love you, my gotta brother. You've got to bring you back. Gotta Anytime bring... you don't want me, I'll okay. be here. we got this, another video that we want to take you out with. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Mo Kelly. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Mm. Special thanks to our sponsors, Harvey Bramman, Photography is an Art, Ron Irwin's High Food Style, Passion, Heart, Larry Buford's Book to the Future, Time Travel, Message in a Capsule, State Farm agent Carla Green, and Rob Brownstein's Actor Training School and Actor Space. And much, much thanks to our guest today, actors, actress, veteran actress Judy Pace, and commentator extraordinaire Mo Kelly. And of course, special thanks to our ever-growing audience. Be well. We'll see you next time. Have a